Salutations, respected viewers. This is George from Ireland. I'm continuing my series about uh, the Great Patriotic War, looking at how Soviet strategy improved. Um, well, it'd been pretty anarchic and dire um, for the first few weeks in 1941, until the Soviet leadership calmed down and got a handle on things. Obviously, some men have been fighting valiantly at the front, but uh, there was a uh, chaos and panic uh, in the Kremlin, and they'd even considered trying to cut a deal with the Third Reich, a second Brest-Litovsk. Could they satiate the Third Reich, give them some Western territory, pay reparations, do whatever, just to stop the onslaught? Because the Wehrmacht had been going through them like a knife through hot butter. Nothing could stop them, or so it appeared. Anyway, Stalin then made Georgi Zhukov his um, main military commander. Zhukov came from a humble family. He'd been apprenticed to a furrier conscripted into the cavalry of the Tsar's army. And Zhukov had risen rapidly through the ranks in, uh, in, in the Russian Civil War. He'd taken the red side, of course, and careers were open to talents. He'd not been trained as an officer, but uh, he arose to be the highest commander in the Soviet Union. He was a stern disciplinarian, and in the Soviet Union that was saying something. He was willing to sentence thousands of his own men to death by firing squad. Um, and he was one of the only men who would tell Stalin, you are wrong. Um, and Stalin respected Zhukov for having the courage to do this, um, even especially when Zhukov said, no, we need to retreat. Um, as the saying goes, you needed to be a very brave man to be a coward in the Red Army, as in you'd be accused of cowardice for retreating, but you'd have to be courageous to do so. Um, Zhukov uh, was to lead the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics to victory. Stalin had been used to planning military campaigns using a library globe, globe and a tape measure to um, uh, calculate the distances. But uh, Zhukov brought a more rigorous and professional approach to uh, things like that. So Zhukov had somehow made it through the purges. Rokossovsky was another very senior Red Army commander who was ethnically Polish. Rokossovsky had been purged in the Great Purges and had been severely beaten up as they attempted to make him confess to all sorts of um, confabulated crimes. But he was hard as nails and he stood up to the beating, realising that his only hope of survival was not confessing because the Soviet legal system put such an emphasis on confession. And because he was uh, valiant and extremely tough, could take the pain, he didn't break. And after months of this, they thought, well, maybe he actually is innocent. A guilty man would not be able to stand up to all this. And then without the explanation, he was released after about a year and given his rank back. One of the very few people to make it through the purges relatively unscathed at that level. So these were the two primary Soviet commanders. Um, there were partisans to the rear of the Germans who started to harass the Wehrmacht, hiding in the forests and ambushing, uh, sorry, ambushing German patrols. And they attacked the overstretched Wehrmacht supply lines. The Red Army sent a few officers and some arms to help the partisans, dropping them in by parachute radios to communicate. The Wehrmacht responded with savage reprisals, killing dozens of civilians if partisans attacked German soldiers. Shooting dead an elderly woman or a babe in arms was not uncommon for the Wehrmacht. The Wehrmacht began to devote more and more men to uh, guard its rear. That meant fewer men at the front to fight the Red Army. Um, Increasingly, these were men that the Third Reich could not afford to spare. Um, and as the supply lines got longer, they were even more exposed to such attacks and less ammunition or less food was getting through to the Wehrmacht right at the front. Um, so when going through the forest, the um, uh, German army would sometimes post non-smoking soldiers at the front because they might be able to smell tobacco, which meant that there were partisans hiding in the woods. Because remember, this is a stage where almost every man smoked. Um, Hitler had forbidden smoking in his presence, not uh, for valetudinarian reasons so much. The uh, health dangers of smoking were not appreciated at the time. There had been a German study in the 30s which concluded it caused pulmonary cancer, but that was um, known by scarcely anybody. Um, and uh, it, was, it was really just Hitler personally loathed it, thought it was a filthy habit. He was minded to ban it throughout the German armed forces. But he was, he was persuaded this would cause a collapse in morale. Men needed it so much to cope with stress and hunger since it's an appetite suppressant. So he was uh, um, convinced not to outlaw it for his troops. 
Um, right, the Wehrmacht was increasingly uh, stretched owing to partisan activity in other countries. Yugoslavia, in particular, where the Wehrmacht lost control of the most mountainous regions. And this is all this is a dilemma in a counter counterinsurgency campaign. Do you try and control everywhere? Well, you can't, because then you have your troops are spread out in penny packets, lots of small bases, where the guerrillas can easily surround them, outnumber them, and then just pick them off one by one, killing your troops, taking their arms, and so on, and creating liberated zones. So, all right, the counterinsurgent forces, you're going to have to withdraw the smallest posts and concentrate them in reasonably large ones, such they can't easily be stormed by the guerrillas. But then you've given the guerrillas free reign. They've got an area to call base, to train all the rest of it. On the other hand, then they might be foolish and try to fight as a conventional army. You could do sweeps on them. Anyway, the British government decided to send a military aid to the partisans, the communist partisans, and not the Chetniks. This was on the basis that the communists were more uh, pugnacious or more effectual in resisting the, uh, the Axis forces. Um, Kim Philby was a British secret agent and he's the one who said that the communists were much fiercer in battling the Axis. Um, now, this may well have been coloured by Philby's uh, political predilections, since um, he was a communist since his days at uh, Trinity College, Cambridge, and moreover, he was an NKVD asset. Yes, he was working for Soviet intelligence. He was their mole inside MI6, the United Kingdom's external intelligence agency. Um, Philby was, in theory, he was a, a diplomat or a journalist at times, that was partly cover for his espionage activities. Espionage activities for the British. The British government not realizing that Philby was feeding every word back to Moscow. Um, so uh, the a liaison officer was sent by the United Kingdom out to the uh, Yugoslav communist partisans. He was one Randolph Churchill. Where have you heard his surname before? Yes, he was the prime minister's only son. And this was seen as a sign of the importance that His Majesty's government attached to the communist uh, campaign in Yugoslavia, and it certainly pleased Tito. An aide to Winston Churchill said that by help of the communists rather than the Chetniks, this would probably lead to a communist regime in Yugoslavia after the war. And Churchill said, do you want to live in Yugoslavia after the war? As if, does it matter? So that was what was Churchill's implication to his interlocutor was. Um, the Wehrmacht became a prize of the fact that Randolph Churchill was in Yugoslavia and they made great attempts to capture him. And he once only just escaped from an island off the Yugoslav coast when it was raided. So in the USSR, there was spy mania. The NKVD's witch finder general was Lavrenti Beria, uh, another Georgian. And he did their best to, sm to smell out these... Uh, foreign agents, as in a Soviet who was passing secret information to enemy governments. Um, in all likelihood, the great majority of those condemned were innocent. Uh, many countries are afflicted by this um, craze about spies in wartime, but um, the USSR, the government was paranoid at the best of times, and these were the very worst of times. They thought it was better to kill many innocents than to risk a single spy surviving. Um, so, uh, and if you had secret intelligence, how on earth were we going to pass it to the enemy? What, I mean, very, almost nobody had a radio in the Soviet Union. They were very expensive. The Soviet Union didn't produce many consumer goods. You couldn't send a letter to the enemy, even to neutral countries, and these were all read by the NKVD. Um, anyway, the Red Army decided they would put paid to desertion and cowardice within their ranks. In the first year of the war, the Red Army executed a staggering 100,000 of its own men for desertion, cowardice, and espionage. Um, it is uh, shocking and a dreadful figure. In the United Kingdom, there's a great deal of controversy over 300 of its own men it executed during the four years of the First World War. Now, we can take into account the larger number of troops in the Red Army, but even bearing that in mind, the per capita execution rate of the Red Army was far, far higher than that. The British Army, the US Army, the Wehrmacht, really any army you care to mention, probably anywhere, any time. The mass killing of its own troops by the Red Army is um, horrifying and speaks much about Stalin's addiction to killing his own people, particularly the innocent. So Stalin had very much enfeebled his forces by authorising judicial murder on such a scale. I mean, <laughs> these were men who could not then be fighting the enemy. They could have been punished in some other way by being sent to a penal battalion or to do to the gulag even. But, and actually there were penal battalions on both sides as a, having to go and go first into a minefield. Hopeless attacks using, being used for diversions 
having to wear dark clothing when the place was covered in snow to draw enemy fire. You're just decoys whilst the real attack goes in somewhere else. And you could be redeemed by your own blood if you came back with a serious wound. Couldn't be just a flesh wound. Then you'd be shot for desertion. So um, that was that. The NKVA KVD would be behind these penal battalions with machine guns to gun down any backsliders. Um, so it was a bit like what uh, Voltaire said about the British once in a while. Shoot uh, an admiral pour encourager les autres. If you didn't do your utmost against the enemy, you could be shot dead. So the siege of Leningrad started in late 1941. Leningrad is now called um, St. Petersburg. Um, and it dragged on through 1942. In those days, many men slicked their hair back with hair oil. Um, and in, in, in Leningrad, there was so little in terms of comestibles, some people were reduced to using hair oil to eat. Um, in Leningrad, stealing a loaf of bread was punished by death. It sounds horrific, and it was, but the situation was ghastly. And had they not done that, then more people would have snapped at the supplies. Um, and people were so driven mad by being ravenous that they were willing to risk death to do this in some cases. Fuel was in very short supply indeed. And remember, it is extremely gel. It could be minus 30 there with the wind chill factor. And very moist air as well. It's a cold that gets through your clothes, that gets into your bones. The combination of this um, insufficient uh, bait and their terrible biting cold killed tens of thousands of Leningraders. Shostakovich composed the Leningrad Symphony to put heart into the Dalty defenders of the Soviet Union's second city. The orchestra played this in Leningrad, almost fainting um, from weakness um, and malnutrition. The hardihood uh, and the courage of the people of Len Leningrad has seldom been equaled, which is why it was since declared a hero city.